Hey everybody, it's Talknosis. We're talking about the experimental filmmaker, bon vivant, uh, gossip monger, Ken of Anger. And to join <laughs> us, we've got Nick Lachetti back on the show. Nick, how's it going? Hey, it's going well. It's good yep. to be back. Yeah, yeah, it's great to have you back. And uh, we have Jason. Jason and I finally showed together after a run a run of solo hosting. So not sure <laughs> when this will come out, but it will come out after a run of solo hosting. Hello, Jason. Hello, hello. Yeah, we, uh, we've been trying to get this show. Well, I've been wanting to do a kind of anger show for years, so it, it made sense to do it with Nick. Uh, we've been trying to get this show out for a little while, so we're glad it's happening. Uh, Nick, you actually wrote a, a paper recently about Kenneth Anger, that there's a video with uh, a, a great introduction by a, a handsome a academic. We will link that in the show notes. Um, <laughs> so I, I did want to dive right in. Uh, Nick, give us the, the bird's eye view, the angel's eye view, Give your just eye view of who was Kenneth Anger. Um, yeah, uh, so Kenneth Anger, like, as you said, was a, an independent filmmaker. Um, ex he's often called an experimental or an avant-garde filmmaker. Apparently, he hated those phrases. He liked independent, um, but but most people would consider him an experimental short filmmaker um, who lived in the 20th century. He just passed away last year, unless unless my uh, maybe 2022, unless my years are getting mixed up. Um, and, you know, he, he also identifies a Thelemite occultist, so a follower of Aleister Crowley's uh, esoteric religion. Um, so he, he was a magician and a mystic. Um, you know, he was kind of spearheaded uh, the origins of queer cinema in the U.S. in a lot of ways as well, and uh, 60s counterculture. Um, so there's just a lot there. It's very interesting in a unique uh, way that really crosses over American popular culture the avant-garde and occultism, which we don't always see that much, I would say. Um, so yeah, he's pretty unique in that regard. And his short films are, he's really incredible. Usually don't have any dialogue, kind of lush, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what you would call them. They're, they're early <laughs> music videos almost in some ways. Yeah, I, I sometimes I think about what people have as a cliche or stereotype in their head as like a uh, as a heady art film short is mm -hmm. like is kind of anger it's almost a, a cliche or stereotype of an art film yeah but he that that's partly because he established the cliches um he died at like age 96 uh he yeah. started in like uh, the, the started his career in 1937 uh was still making short films in the 2000s um by started his career we'll, we'll talk about that in that uh he was a child actor in in hollywood uh he was fascinated with old hollywood right mm -hmm. um how did you first encounter him and, and what drew you to his work uh so for me i think it's you know i'm as everybody probably who has heard me on here knows <laughs> I mean, i've already been into alistair crowley and philema for many years um, i think kenneth anger you know there was probably the earliest thing was his connection his personal connection to jack parsons um, who I don't know if we've really talked about on the show, but uh, Jack Parsons, the, the rocket scientist and American occultist, uh, Kenneth Anger became very friendly with Parsons' widow, Marjorie Cameron. Um, it featured him in an early movie, an inauguration of the Pleasure Dome. So I think it was that. That was the first one I saw. Um, so, and it, it also, also feels like the most kind of traditional uh, decadent occult one uh, out of his movies. So yeah, I think it was that. And then... But I also had an interest in other things that Kenneth Anger had an interest in, in terms of kind of Americana and uh, kind of like old Hollywood stuff. So just that being a crossover or a point of connection between those two kinds of things uh, is probably what got me into him. Yeah. Uh, what is, I mentioned that he, he's the one who sort of sets the cliches for what we think of yeah. in art films. But can you tell us what's groundbreaking in his work and why it matters right now? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so, you know, by mentioning the cliches, I think, and I, I mentioned early music videos, I think we now are used to kind of slightly abstract artistic montage, kind of quick cuts, like in a Scorsese movie or in an MTV video. I don't know. Nobody watches MTV. There's no videos on MTV anymore, but, you know, <laughs> uh, but all that, you know, we're used to that now, but kind of anger, especially in, a, in movies like Scorpio Rising really started that. Um, and it's hard to explain it to you because I don't, People don't often, I was trying to tell my parents about that because they lived through this. Um, but, you know, people don't often think, where did it come from? You know, but mm -hmm. he was one of the first people to put popular music in kind of an abstract short film. Um, Scorsese often talked about him, apparently. But Scorsese, even before Scorsese made his first 
major movies. Uh, he was a professor at NYU film school um, and apparently talked about Kenneth Anger in his courses. So that just had an impact on a large generation of filmmakers, like the quick cuts, the montages, the popular culture, um, counterculture themes as well. So the biker counterculture, that all that, that, that link with homoeroticism and the occult, um, Kenneth Anger definitely helped put that on the map as well. Um, so all of that maybe now seems a little more cliched, but I, I think because of his style, it's still very radical and uh, transgressive, I guess, is, is the, the word people would use, which I guess has become more controversial now. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely a level of transgression in his works as well. Yeah. Can, can you tell us more about his connection to Crowley and the occult and you know how that uh, works with him as an artist, how he contributes outside the sphere of art? Tell us, tell us about the... The, the juicy occult uh, uh, gnosis. Well, I think Kenneth Anger, you know, he, he loved cinema, but he had an antagonistic relationship with Hollywood. Um, so the one, well, he wrote two books, but this one, Hollywood Babylon, very famous work that was originally published in French and was banned in the U.S. at first, and I believe had various obscenity trials around it uh, when it was translated. Um, he was obsessed with old Hollywood, but... He was obsessed with his like dark side, its lurid side, um, to the point where a lot of the stories in this book are kind of contentious, whether, well, not, maybe not even contentious, most of them are not true, probably. There are a lot of them are very gossipy, uh, like crime stories about old Hollywood figures. And I think, um, you know, he was always interested in the kind of dark and transgressive side of human nature. So that's really where his interest in Crowley and the occult came from. Um, even though he loved film, he thought of it as, basically black magic, that his films were kind of cap both capturing light and that's how film works, but then also, um, you know, capturing souls basically through your, he's casting a spell on you for you watching these films. So they're all occult rituals really put in the form of, of short films. Um, so like, I think he personally identifies a Thelemite and, and personally practice, but, um, he didn't, unlike a lot of the, the kind of works about the occult that we kind of see now and maybe in the internet era, which are kind of, you know, how to kind of things like how to do magic, how to do this stuff. He was really interested in doing magic on people, with it, you know, when they watched it. So, which is a little different maybe. Um, so it, there's a performance art piece there, I think too. Um, yeah, I think that was it. And then the kind of the, the other sense with Crowley, I would say, and this is a little bit in the paper I wrote is that, um, he really took to heart the idea of entering a new aeon and this aeon of the child or the aeon of Horus. Um, Crowley was very kind of 19th century in style. I mean, he came from the old aeon, he would say, but Anger was very much interested in tracing in youth culture and counterculture, kind of the ways the new aeon was erupting into society. And a lot of his films are kind of thematic to that. So yeah, I think that he saw like a philosophical background of things he was already feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jason, before I keep barreling on, do you have uh, thoughts, reflections, questions? Well, I, you know, I think also too, like where, where the rest of our kind of uh, document of outlined ideas here uh, goes from is, is it's all branching off of what you've already brought up. But like, yeah, I, a couple of things that, that occurred to me too about like the film as black magic is that like, there's also the, the idea of the word uh, fascination, like to mm -hmm. fascination as like a, um, to literally like entrance somebody, mm -hmm. um, and like how, how much that that's, that's true. Even if you're not making a weird art film involving people dressed up as uh, Egyptian gods, like it's, <laughs> it's, it's true at the Marvel movie level, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, I think that that's just kind of a kind of initial, an initial thought that I've got it's, uh, in a way it's interesting that like, uh, Kenneth Anger is almost safer than a Marvel movie because it's all up front. Like it's very mm. obvious that this is rebellious and transgressive and like, um, and here's, here's the magical stuff that I want to show you versus maybe something more like a, a more subversive or like manipulative, uh, um, fascination of like, mm. you know, um, like a movie that's actually just convincing you that, uh, capitalism is great actually, mm. you know? Maybe, yeah, I mean, you think that, like, Scorsese famously got in trouble for attacking Marvel movies, but I wonder if they're kind of Kenneth Anger films on the large scale. <laughs> and some, because in terms of, like, archetypes or gods or whatever, that, that really has successfully created that mythos. 
Yeah, I mean, well, that like we we could we could sag into a whole uh, 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 Marvel movie popnosis episode here, but like, yeah. but I think there there is an I I mean I, I guess the question would be like what's the what's the the magical impact of those movies and would Kenneth be on be on board with that? And I I don't know that he would. <laughs> um, uh, what's the frequency, Kenneth? Um, sorry, <laughs> that's a weird cut. Um, but. Uh, yeah, no, it's a, um, but it's interesting. Yeah. Like what would, uh, what would he say about those? I mean, did he say anything about those movies? I wonder. I don't know if he's saying, I mean, he was alive for that, the start of that, but yeah. Um, I don't know. I would guess though, that he would have a similar feeling about them that he felt about the Hollywood, the kind of the golden age of Hollywood studio system, because mm. we're really in another and digital version of that in some ways. So, you know, which is funny because Ken, people like Kenneth Anger helped kind of move into this auteur version of cinema. Like, you know, I keep mentioning Scorsese and people like that, but I think that that where you have this director, usually like a male director, who's kind of a genius guy. Mm -hmm. um, but the, he, what he was fascinated by in like Hollywood Babylon was the studio system because of its excesses. Um, and I think not saying it was a good thing because he would, he's saying it was kind of black magic, but it, he was kind of fascinated by the, you know, the, the, the seedier side of that. So I think maybe mm -hmm. if he, if he was, I don't know if he was, yeah, I don't know if he ever mentioned Marvel movies, but I think he could probably find what was dark in it. Yeah. 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 I think that, that would make sense. Um, yeah, there's a, okay. Well, okay. Well, we're going to put a pin in that for a larger episode about <laughs> Marvel. <laughs> yeah. Oh, about yeah. Marvel movies. Um, or a separate episode, but yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating. And well, and there's also like the, the, going back to the Hollywood Babylon thing too, as, as like, because that, um, and I mean, I'll, 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 uh, transition away from Marvel movies by using them is that though the, those movies are still often so defined by the celebrities that are in them. Mm -hmm. And then those celebrities also begin, begin to be associated with every other project they'll ever do. So now like Robert Downey Jr. is, is essentially Tony Stark plus whatever other character he's playing. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, and, uh, but that, yeah, like I think his, yeah, uh, Kenneth's fascination with that, the sort of like the real mythology, not just the, like the, uh, well, real is maybe a loaded term, but the, the mythology involving like living people who are actually doing things in, in Hollywood, um, versus, uh, spiritual beings. I think that's like an, an interesting, uh, uh, correlation there as well. Like, is that something that he was fascinated by is that something that he was like simply finding as the only profitable way mm. to like keep you know making money as an artist um when when these avant-garde movies weren't you know uh w like when the age of horace wasn't also filling his his uh his bank account mm -hmm. you know yeah i mean so one of the things i always liked about hollywood babylon is the tight one of the title pages or that it has this kind of old i forget which movie this is from but it's the old kind of, you know, big Hollywood production. And then it has mm. the code, every man and every woman is a star by Aleister Crowley. Oh, which, cool. Uh, which is always funny because it, it's both like they're, everybody in this book is a star, but also there's some element where you could say that he was really obsessed with like really superficial surface level stuff. Like, you know what I mean? Like on some level, this is like the Kardashian, mm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. universe of the, of the twenties through forties that he's talking about in this book. But he seemed to see it as somehow, you know, projecting these archetypes about, uh, about the Anne of Horus kind of on a big screen for everyone. Um, so yeah, it w I could see a lot of kind of spiritual people thinking, oh, well, why would you, you know, how could a mystic or something write about something like this? Because, you know, stories about somebody overdosing or car crashes or whatever, that kind of stuff that he was really into talking about, but he thought as in some ways you know, following out this energy of the new Aeon, which is going well, to be I, violent. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, like, and, and that, and that, and that like, uh, um, it's not like the mythologies, the, the, that, uh, of our past are always full of incredibly peaceful things in which nice things only happen, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, definitely. Greek mythology, Egyptian mythology is like, people are getting torn apart, you know, people are getting like maimed and cursed and things like that. And so, mm -hmm. um, uh, somebody dying of a drug, drug overdose feels like comparatively light compared to Sisyphus. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, and I think, you know, uh, Crowley said, 
um, in, in the introduction of the book of the law. And I think a lot of this is really where kind of anger is coming from where he talks, he actually says this mentions the cinema. He says, um, consider the popularity of the cinema, the wireless, the football pools and guessing competitions, all devices for soothing fractious infants, no seed of purpose in them kind of Crowley being, you know, sort of very Victorian, but his whole idea was that we are children in the new Aeon and that we haven't really come to terms with this kind of dangerous and transgressive energy that's sort of shifting, you know, away from transcendental authority and old morals and old codes and, and kind of introducing this new energy. So yeah, in, in a lot of ways, you know, people quote that stuff from Crowley, but, um, anger was really saying, you know, I'm going to look for this in, in culture, mm -hmm. which I think is interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, the fun thing about a uh, Hollywood Babylon, which is a book I deeply love is, is, you know, most of it is probably BS. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> really? very, it's, it's Mar very spicy. Marlon Brando. Was it Marlon Brando? Who's the cigarette at who's an ashtray? Yes. Human yeah, I think so. Yeah. Or, or was that James Dean? Maybe I might have been James. Um, yeah. I might be mixing up the yeah. other clad guys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, so, um, uh, but the, the it, it's some of it's probably true. And he never let a uh, he never let the, the truth get in the way of a good story. It's, it's a good piece of mythology that book yeah. on, <laughs> on, on on old Hollywood. Uh, but but I deeply love it. It's a really fun book. Um, and uh, I highly recommend that that people pick up a copy. But this is going somewhere. So he was actually a child actor in whole, old Hollywood. He uh, uh, was uh, uh, lived on the West Coast. Uh, Nick, where, where I'm going to is if, if you're watching the show and you don't know Ke Ken of Anger's work, even though you're hearing about the influence of him, you're probably thinking that he's a, a pretty minor fringe figure. And there's, there's some truth to that, that he loved fringes, but he's actually really central to the 20th century. Because he is right in there. He was roommates of Bobby Beausoleil, one of the uh, the Manson killers. Uh, he befriends uh, the Mick Jagger and Mary and Marion Faithful, who both of whom are involved in his works. He befriends Jimmy Page. He's uh, moving through these circles, uh, uh, encountering some of the most important entertainers of the 20th century. So I just wonder if you could talk about that. You know, the, the sort of the the, the strange uh, elements of him, where he is really embedded in really important cultural movements of the 20th century. Yeah, I mean, I think that especially the 60s and 70s counterculture, he was kind of a major force. Um, and I think, you know, he moved, he, he was in Europe for a time in the 50s and then in the mid 60s returned to the U.S. explicitly saying that he wanted to kind of trace the youth cults, which he felt like would bring kind of all the spiritual energy into the world. So he, he moved to, he was in San Francisco for a time. And, um, you know, I think that a lot of the parties he held there at screenings of what he called the magic lantern cycle. So most of his major films, um, were, which, in, which also often, I think inauguration of the pleasure dome, for example, included kind of the tip to take LSD before watching it at certain screenings. So he was part of that entire kind of counter height Ashbury kind of countercultural movement. And I, so I think that's where he became friends with Mick Jagger and Jimmy page and some of the members of the Manson family. And, you know, I think that. Crowley was already becoming popular during that time. So, you know, like Sergeant Pepper, the cover of Sergeant Pepper's has Crowley on it. And I think, um, Kenneth Anger, I would, I would guess is behind a lot of the impact of, of certain forms of transgressive occultism in, in the sixties counterculture, maybe not behind it, but either influencing some major celebrities and other people that were, that helped to influence, you know, the average person to become more interested in those things, but also. Yeah, I would say maybe he wasn't behind it actually, because I, I would say that, you know, he, he was very early with that too. Cause he, when I was first researching him, I thought, oh, he must have gotten to, maybe he made a few films then gone to Crowley, but he actually started reading Crowley apparently in LA in the forties. So it was, there was a long, he was pushing this stuff earlier than it became a part of popular culture. Um, so I think that, that in terms of an occult influence on rock music, uh, on kind of drug culture. And then just, yeah, spirituality in general, I think he was important. And then, you know, as I mentioned in terms of like his, his techniques in terms of, of, uh, you know, filmmaking because of, of the influence of that, I guess it depends on how much you think his occultism influenced, you know, his techniques, but I think there was a pretty big crossover there. I think, uh, there's been several pieces of writing about his use of symbolist techniques primarily, uh, especially in terms of montage and, and correspondences. 
Um, so going back to like Baudelaire and kind of 19th century poetry. And, you know, since he introduced those kinds of magical ideas into cinema, you could say there's this occult basis for a lot of those, you know, techniques in cinema, which have this huge impact on popular culture. I mean, at a certain point, I don't know, what is it, does that mean that popular culture is, is Thelemic on some level? I don't know, but he definitely had the impact. Yeah. Well, well, that goes quite nicely into my my next question, which is uh, one that I'm going to ramble on for a minute, Nick, because it's 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 sort of weirdly phrased. But does he say something about the occult or contribute to occultism with his films, or is it just there as a thematic thing? And and what I mean by that is, you know, if I write a a, a book about occult philosophy, I'm contributing to almost the theology of the occult, and then I can take that one step further, and I can have unique occult ideas and communicate them through poetry. And these are ideas that are maybe specifically my take on it, right? Mm -hmm. So is he is he doing this with his films, or is it more of a thematic thing? Is it more of a, just a celebration of Crowley's thought, a popularization of Crowley's thought? Or is he making kind of a, an original contribution to the body of thought of occultism mm -hmm. with his films? Does that make sense as, uh, as a question? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I'd be interested in hearing what both of you think about it as well, but I would say that, um, kind of similar to what I, what I was saying is that I think, I don't think he just write, like, I don't think he, occultism is a theme in the way of like, maybe like a horror movie or something like that. I don't think it's also just like a commentary on the occult. I think to, because his films are occult themselves, like they actually are pieces of occultism that are being put in the public and. And I think you guess even just occult being kind of the hidden kind of hidden knowledge or kind of a hidden pattern under underlying things. I think he was explicitly introducing that into popular culture in a certain way. And I think that that's the thing that really, uh, maybe is a contribution to the, to theory of occultism, which maybe depends on kind of your flavor of occultism. But I do think we kind of lack sometimes, uh, you know, an engagement with the modern world in a. Well, you know, people are engaged in the sense of using social media and things like that, modern technology, but really engaging with culture in a way that I don't think um, has has been as as pronounced. Maybe more recently with this idea of all culture, but um, for but all, but a lot of times, even the kind of the the, the occult worlds that I've been part of are very much, you know, they want to be spiritual and kind of separated in some sense from popular culture, whereas Kenneth Anger wanted to be embedded in it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Did he? Uh, well, they, uh, there's also the streak of anti-modernism, right? In uh, yeah. in occultism. So I think that also feeds into to what you're talking about. Um. Um. Can I? Yeah. Can, can I, like just to dive into this too. Like I think there's what you said about his work being intentionally like occult, like as in they were occult works. Mm -hmm. You know, they were spells or you know workings or in, in what like however you might want to define that. Um. It like, I mean, and there's something that, uh, like, I know, uh, I think all three of us have talked about this before on this show, but this, this idea that there is an intersection between art, uh, religion, magic, it, like that all of these things are probably, um, uh, ways of approaching a similar experience that happens to a human mind. Like, mm -hmm. um, and that somebody like anger is intentionally blending those like, um, uh, like it, would, just talking about the notion of the occult or the esoteric, like it makes me think about um, uh, Earl uh, Fontenelle's definition of esoteric that he uses from his program Schwepp, the Secret History of Western es Esotericism podcast, which we did a show on. Listen to that, but also listen to Schwepp. Um, but anyway, his his whole thing is that like the esoteric is literally works that are are um, intending to mean more than they say. Mm -hmm. um, that there's a, that there's something else going on you know um and uh and i think like these movies definitely <laughs> like satisfy that condition like they're intentionally not like the fact that there's no dialogue the fact that they're mostly montages or um uh, a series of cuts you know like that there's musical themes um but on the other hand it's also not hard to tell what he's trying to point at if that makes sense yeah um they're not subtle like no. you know um or if they're subtle they're not subtle uh in some respects like they're they're very uh, upfront of like you know the things that they want to talk about so i i think there's something like uh i'm just now kind of responding as i like when i i i, I binge these movies to prepare for this episode and which was quite an experience okay. um and i mostly watched them i think in chronological order so i kind of mm. felt like i saw them develop 
but like there is something like the the intentional provocation of it like the intentional um transgression of it also i think like today living today that transgression doesn't land quite as big as i think it probably right. did yeah, absolutely. at the time yeah. um uh so i was mostly just seeing the the metaphors and themes in interplay and i wasn't kind of getting that like oh my god i can't believe you just showed me like yeah <laughs> um so yeah sorry i'm kind of rambling there but uh yeah did you have a thought on that nick um I, so in terms of, I, yeah I, I guess i have a few <laughs> so i think so for example one of his movies fireworks which was his first major film i think mm -hmm. um I, I years back i don't think i considered it to, as important or i didn't think about it as much in some ways it's very very important in terms of the history of queer cinema and just avant-garde cinema in the u.s in general but for me interested in kind of an occult angle you know something like inauguration of the pleasure dome or lucifer rising seems more obvious uh, mm -hmm. but but even but i think like you're saying fireworks it's not really subtle and once you're familiar more with kind of initiation idea of initiation for example you can see that that movie is just a like an initiatory cycle you know it's mm -hmm. this dreamer who is dreamer seeking light who's who's kind of traveling through the night um you know runs into violence that sort of initiates him into some sort of kind of uh like psychosexual you know experience um and then by the end of the movie he's back in bed but next to him is like a is a creature or, or you know an angel who has a halo so he's he's somehow it's for me it's like the holy guardian angel or well, really, that's the Lucifer moment. I mean, we didn't mention that yet, but kind of anger was compared to Crowley, who did mention Lucifer sometimes, but anger was very into Lucifer as the symbol for Horus, or Crowley might have said Rahu or Kui, but for, for anger, it was Lucifer. So, and anger has said, you know, every one of his films have a Lucifer moment, mm -hmm. which I mean, is not so much, this is like the scary satanic thing, but this is the moment in his movies that you know, where you, like light has been brought to you in in that kind of masonic or kind of, uh, you know, initiatory sense that you're seeking light. So that seems to be something that recurs in all of his films, even when the themes and imagery change. But it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't feel that subtle because if you're kind of familiar with that sort of ritual experience that just seems to be repeated over and over as movies, uh, Scorpio Rising as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if that, that rambling response to what you're saying, but no, no, it completely does. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I I've got some more thoughts, but maybe John, do you want to chime in on there too? Oh, you know what, actually, Jason, uh, unleash. Unleash. Um, it's, uh, well, yeah, like the, I think the whole Lucifer, I think like, again, going back to the notion of, um, of, uh, transgression is that like, I think there's also um, the, the, the world we live in now accepts so much of what he considered to be transgressive, yeah. but that also that, that coming up through that period created transgression as culture, not just transgression from culture, yeah. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's a big thing that I felt like I, I saw, like, you know, um, like even having everything, having, having a Lucifer moment, like Lucifer, like, obviously you. He's trying to use him in these, in these more like liberatory ways, but also like the only reason he has that liberatory power is because of this Jehovah in the room. You know what I mean? Right. Like that that's kind Gnostic. of lurking in the background. Yeah. 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 Uh, I guess that would be the crossover to the Gnosticism, which would be, um, you know, he, he quoted Crowley's hymn to Lucifer. Crowley said the key of joy is disobedient. Mm -hmm. Um, and in, in that poem in Crowley's hymn to Lucifer, it's very much, um, uh, you know, Gnostic demiurge, Lucifer being this kind of Christic figure that liberating Adam and Eve from the garden. Um, mm -hmm. So clearly that was very influential to anger. And he saw, you know, some, I would say, you know, 40s, 50s America, especially, um, especially being a gay man in, in 40s and 50s America, there was an element of we're in this, you know, post-war garden or something, and I'm going mm -hmm. to break us out of this through, through transgression. So you could be where it would come up in his life pretty, pretty easily. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and the excitement of that transgression, I think like, again, from that Gnostic perspective, like we still see this, uh, um, now that like for a lot of people, what it, what they in most enjoy about Gnosticism is its ability to be, to transgress or to like rebel against, uh, an, an authority structure. Like that's kind of, mm -hmm. it's their, their way in for a lot of folks. And, yeah. and it, it's exciting, you know, like you have this, the thrill of the taboo, the thrill of 
of saying like, what if Jehovah was a bad guy? You know what I mean? Oh, isn't that like, I, I'm so edgy now. <laughs> um, now I'm being facetious. I don't think Ken, or, I don't think Kenneth Anger was being, uh, w was being facetious or I'm not trying to patronize him in that. I'm just kind of talking, I think about the excitement of the excitement, but also perhaps the trap of only ever kind of staying in a transgressive loop. You know, I think it's definitely, a, I think the transgression is probably the thing that hasn't aged as well. Um, mm. I do think on some level, there's still some shocking things in his films that mm. seems to still result in him getting kind of labeled problematic in various ways, especially the Scorpio rising and the Nazi imagery, um, mm, which yeah. is in with the bikers. Um, so there, there's aspects that are still transgressive, but maybe not in a fun way. <laughs> it's sort of, but, uh, and then kind of his association with Manson, which wasn't really him, but, um, you know, Bobby Busole. So I think, yeah, I, I think that, that, that transgression is like a complicated topic that people feel, you know, has, has, has become kind of an argument about whether it's really transgression is effective or if it's then recouped back into the status quo in some way. Certainly a lot of the counterculture motifs that anger kind of referenced have become commodified, you know? Um, so like if like leather jacket and denim and, you know, stuff, you know, rock music, psychedelics, yeah. not necessarily going to, you know, destroy the, I don't know, <laughs> the power structure. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, well, but it, it is interesting too, though, like that notion of even problematic, like, so I, I think, uh, I, I said, I watched the movies in chronological order. That's not quite true. I started with Scorpio rising. Mm. Uh, and then I think I went pleasure dome, Lucifer rising. And then fireworks. So I did kind of jump around a bit there. Um, but uh, what was interesting about starting with Scorpio or no, um, yeah, Scorpio Rising was that like, because all of the Nazi imagery, I was like, is this like, where is this going? Like, I had a moment of like, what have John and Nick got me into? Like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, no, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, because it does like linger on on some of this imagery in ways that make you wonder the perspective it's trying to present you know um yeah uh, having watched the whole thing i don't think it's trying to convince anybody of the values of of nazi germany but i think uh uh but the notion like yeah, i guess it's interesting as much as i was sort of teasing the idea of transgression or saying perhaps it's a, it's not aged as well or it, you said it has an age as well that moment still caught me you know yeah. like it's still it still entranced me there i think um i and john feel free to to break in but I think like uh, with Scorpio Rising and, and that image. Well, first, one thing that's interesting is apparently the Nazi party sued him for that. Uh, <laughs> and they, did, they, they said they sued him for using their flag in a homoerotic <laughs> way, essentially. So he was both protested by the American Nazi party and the Lutheran church for that film because of their, their use of the flag. And then the eclipse from that the film about Jesus that's kind of interspliced with the, mm -hmm. the bikers is a Lutheran missionary film. Um, mm -hmm. So... So it's interesting. He's definitely pissing off everybody in this sense. But, um, but yeah, no, I wouldn't say, yeah, I, I don't think it's, it's pro Nazi. I think there's an element where you could say the danger of that is that he's definitely, you know, not necessarily interested in like a moral decision about any of these things. You know, he's, mm -hmm. and he's interested in portraying it and kind of breaking this is the Anne of Horus thing. And Crowley was an edgelord like this too. It was about mm -hmm. like, you know, breaking down your, your sense of propriety. And so I think Kenneth Anger would definitely like had that, you know, interest in just being a troll and that <laughs> you've definitely a troll. And so, um, so I, I don't know that it was kind of arguable about that aging well, but then, but then the other piece about that, I think is interesting is that Scorpio rising isn't fully a, um, it, I don't know what the word would be, but it's not entirely dramatized. It's actual bikers that he was hanging out with. Mm -hmm. So there's some element where that's a part of, in a in you know for for better or worse obviously for worse with the nazi imagery that's a part of biker culture in america um when mm. he felt on some level he was a documentarian of you know these youth cults or how magic enters the world or the end of horus enters the world and part of crowley's concept about that just to go back to kind of that philosophy is not necessarily that it's going to be without kind of like crowley saw world war one and world war ii as symptoms of the new aeon um that these are this is what happens when traditional transcendental authority breaks down and everyone mm -hmm. is potentially kind of divine themselves, but they don't understand how to kind of in a healthy way. Well, unless you join Crowley's order, you know, you don't know how to, how to deal with that. So it becomes really damaging and, um, you know, violent the way it enters. Or, uh, 
or if, if it was today, then he'd be like, um, just join our premium Start, member yeah, feed. Patreon, then, you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll, go, you'll be clear. Exactly. Uh, you'll be clear. I know, exactly. we're going to get a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Nick, since you're talking about the Aeons, we, we will link to that video, as I said, which is about your paper. But can you quickly tell us about your, your paper? Yeah, I think the way it relates to this conversation is that it was specifically about class and Kenneth Anger. So class in terms of economic class and social class, but um, you know, especially in terms of the fact that Kenneth Anger's imagery is generally working class imagery. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about the way his, his intro, and it also has a crossover with queer and and uh, early gay imagery. So you know, it, it it you know sailors like working class sailors like mm -hmm. uh, like macho men bikers. Um, you know, car customizers, even like I mean, now maybe we associate hippies with being more kind of a middle class counterculture, but at the time it was very kind of street people is like Kenneth Anger's thing. Like he's mm. not usually, he's not necessarily using symbols in kind of Crowley's Victorian way of, you know, the golden dawn style symbols of spirituality for Kenneth Anger, like the kind of the paragons of the new Aeon entering the world are, are essentially kind of working class people that are kind of erupting into our, our society in a way, in somewhat of a violent way, which has some elements of being, you know, I, I mentioned in the paper because of the Hell's Angels connection and other things, you know, this idea now we have of like a Trump and Trump and proletariat Trump. How do you say that? <laughs> uh, you know, the Trump, the, 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 uh, the, deplor the deplorable, they're kind of one of Kenneth Anger's interests, I would say mm -hmm. slightly sexualized, but yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. So the, the, some of the paper was about that, the way he linked kind of working class imagery, uh, Americana imagery to the, to the kind of the advent of the new Aeon. Um, just as a, uh, uh, sort of a bit of a follow-up about that, or like a kind of a connection with that is that, so I, what you were saying there about the, the class structure is that the, what's, what's interesting to me about that when you look at, uh, Pleasure Dome or Lucifer Rising is that it kind of, it's the, not quite the opposite necessarily, but like one yeah. of the things about a lot of the Western esotericism is that it came from like a large structure, which involved a lot of Freemasonry, which involved a lot of people who were in this sort of like rising middle class, yeah. people who had money and time to build like, you know, alchemy materials and go on retreats yeah. and, and wear a lot of fancy robes and clothing and stuff. And so like that, that is kind of a, that the thing I noticed in them, in the more like obviously mythologically magical mm -hmm. things is that they're like, you know, uh, th there weren't any bikers or sailors walking through the pleasure dome, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. I, yeah. I don't know if there's okay. a difference yeah. there. Go ahead. I think pleasure dome. Yeah, definitely. Um, and though I would say Lucifer rising, it definitely is the most like classically like philemic movie he did where it's like, here's the, this is the representatives, the gods who are representatives of the old Aeon and then here's the new end. But there is the moment where the, the Lucifer, the Lucifer moment where the ritual is kind of complete and you see the physical incarnation of Lucifer, he ends up being like, uh, you know, a, a, a leather clad, like you with long hair. Yes. So it, that eruption right. into yeah. the movie, you know, maybe the gods are kind of, this is the old Aeon, but the new Aeon is this new energy that does kind of connect back to all of his favorite things like, you know, James Dean, Marlon Brando. That's like the person that's, that's the personification of Lucifer in it. So I think that fits uh, pleasure dome is pretty early. And I do think it's more of a, it definitely has this kind of classic symbolist, you know, mm -hmm. decadent feel that, you know, maybe it doesn't have as much of what I'm talking about. No, but yeah, no, it's a, uh, well, and I, I think it's also just even the tension between it is a useful thing to think yeah. about too, yeah. but it, well, and I guess what's interesting is that like, as you've reminded me is that Lucifer rising does try to re start to reconcile that yeah to try to say here's the two worlds you know coming to coming together or or reaching its apotheosis and so yeah. or this is the new world entering the old one is exactly kind of the explicit way i think it, that's the most religious movie in some way and mm. but I, I, i'm not saying i think he says that that's a religious statement mm. yeah so cool. uh Nick, uh, uh, I'll tell you mine, uh, that yeah. I also did a, a watch slash rewatch, uh, but, uh, I, I, beyond the pleasure dome and loose for rising, which might be the two quote unquote, most occult of the films, mm -hmm. uh, are my two favorites, uh, anger flicks. Uh, what are yours and why? I'm still Scorpio rising, which is the one that's most popular probably on some, with, with nine occult people, I would say Scorpio rising has been his most influential. Um, but I think it's still my, my favorite because for me. 
that's really what, what I like about him is that kind of, uh, you know, enmeshment of kind of, uh, like American popular culture and, you know, counterculture with, with occult ideas. And I think it, in some ways it is like the best encapsulation of, of kind of what we've been talking about, where there is kind of an initiatory journey going on there. There's occult symbolism. Um, but it's really, it also kind of works as a movie, which maybe is why it's been popular. There is at least kind of a plot in some sense or a character. Um, so I think that that's always been my favorite. And I really like the soundtrack. So for me, it's like mm. following the soundtrack along with that movie, which maybe now again, doesn't seem as radical, but at the time was, but for me, like the use of things like he's a rebel for the intersplicing of the, the bikers and Jesus is really interesting. There's like mm. theological statements there. And then it, maybe for me also, that movie is the one that's most, most about kind of a death drive. So for me, the, the death of God movie in a lot of ways. <laughs> Um, this is like, you know, this figure who's, you know, the, the, the Marlon Brando guy eventually, I mean, it's unclear if the main character or someone else dies, but at the end, someone wipes out and, you know, crashes and there it ends with sirens. Um, and I think that that is a very clear kind of dying God or dying, dying Christ or Osiris kind of motif going on there. Mm -hmm. Um, cause he's really identified the, the bikers with Jesus and the apostles. So it has this death of God imagery that I, I really love, um, compared to uh, at least for Rising, which I think I, Bobby Busselet actually very perceptively, who's in prison for the Manson, some of the Manson murders, um, has said, who was originally supposed to play Lucifer and Lucifer Rising and make the soundtrack. Um, he actually talked about how those two films are kind of diametric, di are dialectically connected. So you have the Scorpio Rising, Lucifer Rising, Death of God, and then the kind of coming of the new Aeon. And that's kind of my whole jam. <laughs> so I like those two for me. In, in a nutshell, that theologically is my whole thing. So those are probably my favorite. I do like fireworks a lot more now too, because I just think it's interesting <laughs> to be kind of a movie that's occult without being occult in some ways. So, oh, and I do, sorry, I gotta mention more. So my other one is Custom Car Commando. I'm always telling people about this one. Okay. And I think people watch it and are like, what, what is it, why? But it's only like three, two minutes, three minutes. It's just one song. Dream Lover by the Paris sisters overlaid on someone cleaning his like super shiny homoerotic like phallic car and just like <laughs> rubbing it and cleaning it. And so, but for me, like there's two reasons that movie is cool. I like the, it's kind of very lush. And I guess for me, there's some, the Dream Lover adds the whole dimension where the car, which has this connotation of a death drive of, you know, a fetish object, like the car is kind of like, you know, this talisman or something. It's your, it's your dream lover in some way. The chrome car is like, and to me, that actually reminds me of the idea of like a holy guardian angel or like a higher, like this, the car is the higher self of this guy or something. So I love that. But then also it's funny to me that Kenneth Anger actually got a grant from the Ford Foundation to make that movie. And he took like several years, used all of the money and he just produced two minutes of a guy washing his car, which apparently got him in trouble. So I thought that, I guess that's hilarious. <laughs> it's pretty great. Uh, well, folks, we will uh, uh, we also put the uh, the links in the the show notes. But uh, most of the films are available online for free, so uh, watch them and tell us your favorite kind of uh, anger in the comments below. Uh, Jason, when you did your big uh, watch slash rewatch, uh, uh, maybe broke part of your brain if you binge them. I I I would definitely say you know spread them out a little bit. But uh, what, what was your favorite and why? You know. I think actually, uh, um, uh, Scorpio rising is probably my favorite from, at least from the perspective of it being, uh, watchable, like not, not, not the rest of them are unwatchable, yeah. but it is the most watchable, I think. Um, and I think there's something, uh, really like, because it's probably also the most, it's living almost in the uh, closest to the realm of documentary. Um, so it's got this, th this sense of like a, a, uh, uh, somebody who is involved in all of the stuff that we're talking about here regarding like Gnosticism and the occult, but he's, he's applying that to a culture that he's directly engaging with. And so you're kind of getting that synthesis, which is, I think, super interesting. Uh, the soundtrack again is, is amazing and makes it really watchable. Um, uh, so it's probably my favorite for that reason. Like, I think it's the thing that, and it's also that, that notion of it being in a documentary sense, it's both about like the aeon but it's also kind of about like just america like what's yeah. going on in north america like at that time but ar arguably even still now yeah um uh so yeah i think it's the probably that one that hits hardest i think the rest are beautiful 
um, but often perhaps, uh, again, not harder to watch, but maybe harder to, to just keep watching, to just settle into, you know, mm-hmm. I think everything else kind of feels like, oh yeah, I, th- I, I see what you're doing here. Yeah. You know, um, Actually, I think interesting with Scorp- Scorpio rising soundtrack, I don't know if it's true. The other thing we maybe didn't say is that some of the, a lot of the things Kenneth Anger said were not always true, <laughs> but he claimed the soundtrack was literally just he would go to Coney Island, hang out with the bikers, some of whom were in the film, and whatever was the top hit of that day on the radio, he would be like, oh, it's going to be in the movie. So mm-hmm. it was like, this is just their, like their rate, you know, the radios they were carrying around, like at the Coney Island piers, like this is, so he didn't think about it. I don't think, it doesn't seem, I feel like it's not necessarily the, the case, but it, it kind of reinforces your point that it's the synchronicities of, you know, he's really embedded in kind of that moment in American culture and then mm-hmm. just kind of you know, esoterically documenting it. So mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Choosing where to put the frame. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess we should, we should start the wrap up. Uh, Jason, any, any closing questions? Um, you know, I, so there, there is a, a last question you've got on the sheet here. That's about, uh, is he relevant now? And I think like, I just want to want to want to jump into, into answering that, at least in terms of like thinking about anybody listening who is like, I, maybe they don't know anything about Kenneth Anger or they're wondering, there still might still be wondering why we're talking about this on a Gnostic show. Um, is that I think like uh, what I what I think is so valuable is to make something or to be like producing something, not just trying to necessarily follow something. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to make a movie or write a novel or you know what I mean. Like you don't, it doesn't have to be an ex, an extensive thing, but like um, that notion of trying to synthesize what you're feeling about the world about, you know, about your spirit, about any of these things into something that then gets externalized, I think is just incredibly valuable. So, uh, I think he's valuable. He's relevant now, if only to hopefully inspire someone else to make something. Yeah. And, uh, you, what's your take on the other question, Nick? Is he, is he relevant right now? Yeah. I think on two levels, I think, um, both as Jason's saying, you know, I, I wish more occult, this occulty people or Gnostics or esoteric people would kind of think more in the way that Kenneth Anger thinks. So, and I, I mean, I, I think this podcast does a really good job of featuring people who are doing this, but, and, and, but, you know, not just to write, you know, how to kind of books about how do you do rituals, how do you do magic, but how does this actually kind of uh, interrelate to our actual culture and, and situation, <laughs> you know, both in our personal lives and our society. I think you don't need to make like copies of Kenneth Anger, but you need to figure out how kind of your, your ideas, you know, uh, enmesh with, with the world around you. So I think that's really interesting to me. And then as I kind of alluded to earlier, I do think the kind of the violence and the, 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 the energy, which can both be for good kind of progressive ways, countercultural ways, but also could, can, you know, as in Scorpio rising, you know, erupt in kind of a violent and fascistic way that gets still what we're living in. So I don't think we've, transcended Kenneth Anger's vision of what America is like, really. So I think his, his ideas are still really relevant, um, in, in, you know, 2024 the election year kind of situation. Like this is the, the, this, this kind of anger for, for Kenneth, you know, that he's featuring that's kind of what people are like the death drive and everything about that to me is not old fashioned or, or outdated, but is literally mm-hmm. what we're living through. So. So I say. Okay, well, that's the, I, I think that is a, a pretty good summation. Uh, folks, you can help us do the show by patreon.com slash Gnostic, giving us a little as a dollar per piece of media per month. Please notice per piece of media. We usually put, you know, four or five pieces of media on there. Uh, we don't really give you anything in exchange for giving us money except for making the show. Uh, we... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, lots of podcasts, uh, you know, they do get folks saying, not that we don't want to give you something, we just don't know what to give you because we don't want to lock up any content behind paywalls. We give you early access to the shows when we take in advance, and if you ever have any ideas, just uh, message us. Um, you know, I, I think I've said this before, but uh, if, if you go up a Patreon tier, I'll send you Jason's phone number. Uh, mm-hmm. Just text him, he can come over and help you with your dishes, something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, if you really want to go crazy, like join the highest level or just donate a ton of money and then we'll make some Gnostic movies. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. Um we'll remake <laughs> all of Kenneth Banger's films. Um, yeah. yeah. Live. 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 Yes. Yep. 
paypal.me slash gnostic for one time donation uh nick thanks again come back to yeah. the show again everybody uh check the comments for the links to kind of anger films as well as that uh, talk on nick's paper on kind of anger bye everybody bye, bye.